Welcome back. I'm Jane Rogers. So we've talked about lifestyle, and according to the Buck Institute for Research on Aging, how optimizing exercise, what you eat, how well you sleep, and managing stress can get you 90 plus percent of the way there to living to 90 to 95. But there are other interventions called gerotherapeutics to put on your radar and talk with your own doc about to see if one or more of these might be right for you. We're going to unpack each one one by one in a series of videos in this module. So the first we'll explore is rapamycin. It's being called the cornerstone of anti-aging medicine, and who wouldn't want an extra 30% lifespan? The drug's been around for decades. It's got a good safety profile. It extends life in almost all trials for an array of model organisms. I think that it will become a household word in the next five years, if I'm right, right? If we really do wow. start to see these benefits. Um, but I also would say rapamycin's, you know, it's it's the first best shot on goal right now. There's going to be better things coming down the pipeline. So I'm not, I don't want to make people think rapamycin is a miracle drug. It's not um, in the sense it's not going to, it's not a fountain of youth. Um, and I think better things will come along as the research continues to progress. Also, in this NIH National Institutes for Health opinion article, which I posted for you to read more fully below if you'd like, the author writes, quote, Furthermore, the alternative to the reversible and avoidable side effects of rapamycin are the irreversible and inevitable effects of aging cancer, stroke, blindness, and premature death. I will also discuss why it is more dangerous not to use anti-aging drugs than to use them, and how rapamycin-based drug combinations have already been implemented for potential life extension in humans. If you read this article from the very beginning to its end, you may realize that the time is now." Unquote. As a postdoctoral student at MIT, Dr. Matt Caberlin was searching for genes that affected lifespan and by luck and accident discovered that lifespan could be extended by suppressing the gene TOR, which in mammals is called mTOR, mammalian target of rapamycin. This was back in the early 2000s. mTOR's essential role in natural selection is to signal cell division when it determines the environment is supportive of reproduction. However, by continuing after reproduction, high levels of these signals lead to functional declines in aging. But when mTOR is blocked, these declines are delayed and lifespan is increased. David Sinclair, PhD, is a professor in the Department of Genetics and co-director of the Paul F. Glenn Center for Biology of Aging Research at Harvard Medical School. He writes in his New York Times bestselling book, Lifespan, quote, when all is well and fine, TOR is a master driver of cell growth. When it is inhibited though, it forces cells to hunker down, dividing less and reusing old cellular components to maintain energy and extend survival, unquote. There are several pharmacological agents that inhibit mTOR, but rapamycin appears to be the most effective. In tests on a variety of organisms, from yeast to mammals, rapamycin has been shown to delay and even reverse cellular decline and thereby increase health span and lifespan. It's still cutting edge, though, to use rapamycin off label for human longevity. Here's more from the ninth. Aging Research and Drug Discovery Meeting in Copenhagen. I very much have become of the opinion that it is appropriate to use these things off-label and that physicians can make a decision when off-label use of metformin, rapamycin is appropriate for their patients. And, and you know, I'll just tell you, I've seen a lot of data from people who are using rapamycin off-label. And I personally believe that it works really well for some, some people, not for everyone. We need the clinical trials. We absolutely need to know what the risk benefit actually is. But I can tell you, there is a risk to not doing anything. And it's gonna take a long time, I believe, to do these very large clinical trials. Dr. Kaberlin is currently conducting a clinical trial at the University of Washington, where he's a full professor with pet dogs called Triad, test of rapamycin in aging dogs. 
Initial results are confirming that rapamycin can slow aging in dogs, increase lifespan, and increase health span. And, and what I mean by increasing health span is to really delay or push back many, maybe all of the declines in function that go along with aging and also the diseases of aging, which is, I think, what most people think about when they think about aging. They think about cancer, heart disease, dementia, kidney disease. Um, and, and our goal is really to, to, to really try to push all of those diseases of aging back as far as possible in companion dogs, in the Dog Aging Project, but then in the, the sort of larger field of uh, aging biology or, or, or geroscience in people as well. Rapamycin therapy appears to be helping the dog's weakest organ. In our first um, trial, what we, we, we gave the dogs echocardiograms before and after rapamycin treatment. And what we saw was if you looked across all the dogs that got rapamycin and you compared them to the placebo dogs, so these all of our studies are double-blind placebo-controlled uh, randomized clinical trials. The dogs on average who had gotten rapamycin had an improvement in heart function by these echo, uh, echocardiographic parameters mm -hmm. compared to the dogs that didn't get rapamycin. Also, it was found that 12 weeks of rapamycin treatment in mice in several experiments was enough to remodel the gut microbiome and also the oral microbiome. In addition, other experiments saw improvements in immune function. In multiple tissues now, people have seen that if you treat mice with rapamycin for, for you know, between six to 12 weeks, you um, see improvements in stem cell function in many different tissues. The one that excites me the most are uh, uh, hemato what are called hematopoietic stem cells. So these are kind of the stem cells that seed the immune system. And we know that immune dysfunction is a real problem during aging in, in people. I mean, look, just look at the, look, look at where we've been for the last two years, right? Yeah. Um, so if we had a way to rejuvenate immune function in older people, that's really, really important. That's big. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's important not only for the obvious reason, like COVID-19 or influenza, but one of the most potent anti-cancer mechanisms we have is our immune system. And that's probably one of the big drivers of why we see a big spike in many cancers as people get older. It's because their immune system isn't doing as good of a job at clearing out those cancers early. So if we can boost the immune system, we can have an indirect effect on age-related cancers. And that's what's, we, that's what's seen in mice with rapamycin. So yeah, so it's pretty exciting. So I, I think there's reason to be optimistic um, that, okay. that rapamycin can be a very powerful preventative for not just Alzheimer's disease, but other types of dementia as well. We know a lot about the, the, the biological mechanisms that, that um, at least precede dementia and Alzheimer's mm -hmm. disease. And, and we know that rapamycin can have an impact on those mechanisms. And we could talk more about that if, if you'd like to in a few minutes. Um, the other thing we know is that in mice, you know, it, there's a little bit of a, there's a lot of debate about whether mice can be used as a good model for Alzheimer's disease. Um, because mice during normal aging don't get true Alzheimer's disease, but they do show cognitive decline with age during normal aging. And the cool thing about rapamycin is that in the mouse models, it's been shown in basically all of the major mouse models of Alzheimer's disease to be beneficial. It's also been shown to delay or prevent normal age-related cognitive decline in mice. So, and this is why I think it's, it's, you know, a, it's a better bet than, than things that just affect the Alzheimer's disease models in mice. Because those Alzheimer's disease models are kind of missing the normal aging component, the, the, the changes that go along with normal aging. And, you know, Alzheimer's disease, if you think of all of the different diseases of aging, Alzheimer's disease, you know, is one of the, the, the strongest in terms of, of risk as a function of age. Your risk of getting Alzheimer's disease, you know, goes up dramatically, exponentially as you get older. So there's clearly a underlying normal aging component that creates a permissive state for dementia and for Alzheimer's disease. So I think there's lots of reason to believe that, that rapamycin um, can, be, can be beneficial as a preventative for Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. I'm a little bit less sure whether rapamycin will be beneficial once a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease has been made. So now to the nuts and bolts, how to find a doctor to see if a rapamycin prescription might be right for you, what dosing is best, and what's the cost. A good source to turn to is Rapamycin News. 
I'll put the link below for you. Under the Buy Rapamycin tab, you'll find some articles. One is a full list of prescribers who can evaluate you for a rapamycin prescription. In the U.S., Australia, Mexico, Brazil, U.K., Europe, and some other countries. Some, you have to see them in person. Some can do phone consultations. I do, I, I do recommend that, that people who are interested potentially in learning more about rapamycin or taking rapamycin, if at all possible, find a medical doctor who will prescribe it for you. I know there are people who get rapamycin from offshore pharmacies without any medical supervision. My advice would be to do it under medical supervision. And there are a growing number of MDs who are are. Um, comfortable with evaluating people and determining whether something like rapamycin is, is the right choice for those people. There's another article on rapamycin news about cost and rapamycin, known in the clinical setting as sirolimus and where to get it. It's not a cheap drug. One can expect to pay about $200 a month. You know, the way that we handle healthcare in this country is a mess and, and prescription drug prices reflect some of that. So, uh, you know, there are all sorts of um, lower priced uh, options that are out there once you've got a prescription. And so shop around, I would say. Um, and I think as long as as long as the rapamycin that you're getting is coming from, you know, a, 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 an international or multinational pharmaceutical company who's producing it, it's it's probably going to be just fine in terms of quality. I know there's a lot of concerns about quality of, of drugs from different parts of the world. It's my impression that, that most of the drugs are, are made in the same places and then they're just packaged differently. So um, I, I, I'm not personally so concerned about that. Personally, for my husband and me, we're tolerating rapamycin well. I take six milligrams once a week and my husband takes 10 milligrams because he weighs more. Also, he's 77 years old, wears a short beard, and it's actually turning from white to black again. He's written about his experience while on rapamycin, and I posted that essay below. I've tried to cover the basics here about rapamycin, but I posted many resources below in case you want to dive deeper. I hope this was helpful. May we all live longer, better in health. Mm -hmm.